We're up above Portsmouth here, uh, looking down on Portsmouth. We've come to Fort Nelson, which is the home of the Royal Armouries Museum, and uh, there's an assault force here and lots of things for us to see. So let's go and have a look. And here's the man himself, Vice Admiral Lord Nelson. That says he appeared at the Battle of Trafalgar on the 21st of October 1805. So over the bridge into Fort Nelson we go and it's free, it's uh, one of the national museums so it's, it doesn't cost you anything to come. We paid £3 for parking, that's cheap at twice the price. And we enter now into the museum area where we start to see some of these guns. Not all of them British, this one is uh, an American. And look at the size of that. It's so big they made it in two pieces. Because trying to move all of that is a pain in the butt, to use the technical side of the word. Trying to move half of that once is still a pain in the butt, but at least you can do it. <laughs> is that what it fires? That is, yeah. Gosh. Wow. How do they put those in there? That is a very, very good question, isn't it? Is there one down there? Oh, really? Well, this is the thing. So, in the Middle Ages, obviously, there's no hole at the back, but there is a breach, there's a gap in the middle. And that's obviously a really, really old technology. Like, breach loading guns, we tend to think that's going to be modern, but it goes right way back to the Middle Ages. So, it's possible that what they would do is take that apart, put it in the back, seal it together, and then, obviously, you know, and then fire it off from there. But if that's true, then we've got a bit of a problem. Because if you look at the back of that gap there, those cannibals don't fit. They do not fit in the gap. So the question is, therefore, is what we think about this gun wrong, or are those no cannibals? And the answer is, we have no idea. No idea. That was a very interesting talk on the Turkish gun there. We've just come outside because there's a couple of really ornate guns out here. Is that that one? Really went to some effort just to decorate these things so that they could fire cannonballs out of them. Nah. Right, actually in the middle of the fort. There's some look at the armour here, so it's not just about the guns itself, it's how to protect yourself from the guns. Um, it's, I can't, it's not I think it's just stuff. These are some of the damage done to, well, oh, nearly six inches of steel there, six inches of iron. And then on the other side, what actually happens, look, blisters it away. And this one, what happened here? My goodness, armour piercing shot could defeat even the thick armour. Why did that not hurt? I'm sure it would hurt. Yeah, well don't hit it hard because it will very much hurt because that's, that's armour. He's a four and a half inch anti-aircraft gun. Ooh. So four and a half inches or 114 millimetres. You can actually fire at a rate of 12 rounds every minute, so that's quite quick. And he's obviously shooting down aircraft or trying to shoot down aircraft. And uh, came into service around about 1938. 
and uh, it was declared obsolete by 1951. This big huge parade ground here which has got some guns dotted around and you can see the fort defences all around the edge here. Um, unusually I suppose you'd think all of the guns would be pointing towards the sea but they're not, the guns are all pointing towards the land. This fort was built to protect from a French invasion and the French invasion wouldn't come in through the main port of Portsmouth, it would have come from a port somewhere or some landing area uh, either to the west or to the east and then the, uh, the uh, soldiers would have been marching across land and would have uh, attacked, well that's what they feared, they would have attacked from the, the rear of, of Portsmouth. So this is to protect uh, from, this fort is to protect the port of Portsmouth from an invasion which came from the land, not from the sea. There's, um, over here we've got the assault course, William's already had a go on that. And uh, we're just looking at a, a tunnel, he's very keen on having a look. Uh, because it's a fort, it's got uh, lots of arm armaments and uh, this particular tunnel is one of them. One of the things to go down. This is, what's this one? It'll tell you what it is. This is the North Mortar Battery. And we're actually part way down the main tunnel. And uh, part way down we find the magazine. The main magazine. It's the lamp room. You've got to be very careful with lamps down here. Remember there'll be candles. Gunpowder and candles don't really mix. And this is the shifting room. In 1871, this room was originally designated as the shifting room. All the barrels of gunpowder entering the fort had to be checked in and examined in this room. And those found to be damaged or leaking or unsafe were moved to the shifting room. So this is where they would be stored. And this main tunnel goes for another 100 yards or so down there. We're going to go back the other way though. So the room to the right is where they can prepare shells. And there are storage rooms. So we will wander through this one. To mind your head. And look, here's the area where they can be storing the barrels of gunpowder. Definitely mind your head here. And then we're going to make our way up to the top. Well, we just got to the top of the tunnel and we've come to the other rank solutions. Uh, this is a wash area. All the taps say cold. No hot water in here. And then I guess that's the drain area. This is for all the NCOs. So we've just come into part of the museum. They've got lots of wonderful examples of ancient guns. And <laughs> the bottom one here just looks like a bit like a rifle. So not much anybody holding that. But incredibly on it. Made from bronze. This is a bronze falconet, highly decorated gun bearing the arms of Henry Sidney, who was Romsey, the Master General of the Ordnance. Look at this one here. It's a bronze gun, beautifully barrel, cast a barrel from the, uh, in the form of a dragon.
This is perhaps the largest exhibit here. And what have we got? We just got a really long tube. And this isn't all of it. The whole tube is supposed to be 150 meters long. It was actually designed by Gerald Bull um, at the auspices of Saddam Hussein and uh, designed to fire one meter shells. There. It was designed by Gerald Bull, but built in Sheffield to be shipped off to Saddam Hussein in Iraq. But it was intercepted on the way, never actually got there. 150 metres long, um, too big actually to support itself. So uh, the sign here says, find a convenient mountain side, so something to lean it against and you'd need some other support as well to stop it bending. So this part of the museum's got lots of other guns, some of them more modern than others. So field guns just come around to this side. Another anti-aircraft gun, we've already seen one of these outside. Why was Fort Nelson actually built? Well, Fort Nelson forms part of a massive ring of brick masonry and earth forts uh, that were built to provide the firepower to deter an enemy attack on Portsmouth from land, not from sea. Portsmouth was Britain's premier naval dockyard, uh, building and maintaining warships that were vital to the defence of Britain and her growing empire. The fact that the guns were pointing inland uh, meant that they were sometimes referred to as the Palmerston Follies. During the reign of Queen Victoria. This, in fact, is a fine Sikh gun which was used to oppose the British. And this is an early example of a machine gun, French design from 1879, 35mm revolving gun. And a selection of different rifles and handguns. to enter a Victorian barrack room. So here we've got the sleeping quarters. They look rather short beds, they must extend out. Dining table already set. And of course, head of the table. Each of the beds has a storage area for uniform, boots, and down below the bed. Then we head off into the Victorian officer's mess kitchen. Big table, mangle there, doing the washing. Sink and uh, fire for doing all the cooking. this side we've got a bigger range there and the preparation tables and a boiler 
no? Ecco che da me. Water tank up at the top. And then the bells which would signal where the staff had to go to. And to room, the office of mess, or of course, the billiard room. Lots of different cannons here. Rooms full of them, different shapes, different sizes, short ones, long thin ones, bronze. Curious one here, look. Collection of different uh, apparatus and small arms that might be used. Powder flasks, rammers, and a worm which was to help clean out the gun. It is a bronze six pounder field gun and carriage. This is the main tunnel, just standing here, I can feel the cool air blowing up. I'm just going to have a look in this hangar, but just before I go in, you can just actually see just that there's this beast of a gun on the railway tracks. Inside this hangar we've got some really big equipment. This one is huge. A French gun. This one is German in origin. Dates back to 1895. It's uh, a nine centimeter quick firing gun. Just moving down here, we've got some more German artillery. So, this one is another 7.7 .7 centimeter quick firing German gun from Krupp, dated in 1905. It's a Russian field gun. 76.2 millimeter. Again, uh, quick firing howitzer. 1929. Beast that greeted us on entry is actually a British howitzer, dating from 1918. It has an 18-inch bore. A range of around 20 kilometers. Going to some smaller one now, this is a 17 pounder Mark I. It's an anti-tank gun and uh, dates from 1943, it's British. Another British one here, nice long barrel, breech loading. Uh, it's called a medium gun, dating from the 1942, another occasional tank killer. I'm just Looking through here, we've got lots and lots of different guns. So if you're into guns, all shapes, all sizes. So this one's a smaller one. This one's another Russian one. Uh, just a 4.5 centimeters, 45 millimeter. And this is a light anti-tank gun dating from 1942. It actually says 1937 on it as well. This is, uh, Anti-tank killer from the Germans, 75 mm anti-tank gun, again around about 1941, so Second World War gun here. It's another Russian one. Another Russian one. Just getting down to a British one, here's the British one. This is a 25 pounder, it's quick firing, howitzer. Uh, Mark III, dating from 1943. This one uh, is armour-piercing, 
projectiles, which were about 9 kilos, a range of 12 kilometers. making my way back on all on this right hand side we've got these quite large guns now so we've just gone past the smaller ones but these are pretty big things this one is an Iraqi howitzer from from the 1980s another Russian one rugged and reliable it's referred to as 152 millimeter quick firing howitzer used by the Chinese 1970-1980 so it's a Chinese built copy of the Soviet Union D20 so it's coming over here an anti-aircraft gun again Russian 1983 1979, 100mm quick firing anti tank gun, nice long barrel on that one, and then a whole range of other. It's another Howitzer oh, Italian, it's a British 1959, 120mm. He said the thing this one, special about this one, is it's recoilless. There's one of the Argentinian 1968 recoilless gun. And here we've got the workhorse of the British Royal Artillery, Horse Artillery, a six pounder bronze smoothbore field gun. French one captured at the Battle of Waterloo. Hard hitting howitzer. And we are just coming towards the end of these. And just before we leave. Look at that huge, huge gun. Shell that might be fired from that huge gun. So here's the only gun that's actually left in position up here on the rampart. So we're just making our way up from the parade ground now. Anita's gone ahead with William, but I'm a little bit of a slow coach here. We should get up to the ramparts. There's a, there's a nice ramp here to take me up to the ramparts. And I guess they would have needed this to get all of the uh, equipment up. And as I said before, the, the guns are pointing inland. They're not pointing out towards the sea because they're not designed to defend ships coming in they're designed this was fort was designed to defend against um, invasion from land when the French the arch enemies at the time would have landed made the way across land to attack Portsmouth from the rear and so these were built to uh, protect from the from the north in effect so we have all of these huge gun emplacements here. William, where is he? Hey! My goodness. Hiding there, were you? What do you think all this is about? What's this? 
where the gun used to be, isn't it? So there used to be a huge gun here that they could move around and they could point over the top of this. Well, the disappearing gun. It's not there anymore. So let's see if we can find one. for me to take a photograph, I think. Yeah, most of the guns are no longer here, but this one here, look. If we have a look to see where it's pointing, it should be out to the forests and beyond. Just had a lovely day at Fort Nelson. So, William, was it a good day out? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Two thumbs up from William. Must be a good one. How about you, Nana? Good fun. Good fun. Enjoy it. Yes. Have you got your steps in? Yes. I don't know. Not yet. Oh my goodness. We went. We did 300. No, 275 steps just going in the tunnel. Didn't we? How many steps down in the tunnel? 275. That's a lot of steps just in the tunnel. I'm going to start a tunnel back there. That's a lot of steps. Anyway, great day out, well worth it. Free admission, just paid for three pounds for the parking. Lots and lots to see, fun activities for the children. And uh, the assault course. Eight. Eight times on the assault course, fantastic. And a little workbook for all for you to do. Nearly finished it. And a nice new t-shirt. And a nice new t-shirt. And a nice new t-shirt. Thanks very much for watching. Watching? Watching. And also a... And don't forget to subscribe and like. And we'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.